At this point, uh, I'd like uh, to uh, call uh, Francis Ray, the Policy and Advocacy Manager, uh, Europe, Russia, and uh, Middle East uh, uh, Fonterra, and he will be talking about the strategy of uh, Fonterra in action and the creation of uh, a global cooperative. It's a real pleasure to be here. First of all, thank you uh, very much to the CLAL team. Um, thank you to uh, Angelo. Uh, grazie, grazie mille. I have a real affinity with um, Italy. My wife is Italian. She's from Piemonte. Uh, so for me, uh, it's a, ple a particular pleasure to be here. I think of it as a beautiful country with beautiful dairy products. And I'm allowed to say this because my wife is Italian, beautiful women as well. So thank you for, for letting me be here. Um, now. Now, as has been mentioned, I am from Fonterra, the New Zealand-owned dairy cooperative. It's a company that was mentioned a number of times in yesterday's workshop. It hasn't come up so much today, but I thought it would be useful to spend a little bit of time uh, introducing you to Fonterra, even though you're familiar with us. Uh, some facts about our business would be useful for you, I think, uh, going forward. Um, secondly, uh, although not all of our production is in New Zealand, most of it is, and so I'll give you a few facts about dairy production in New Zealand. And then finally, I will finish with um, a, a coverage of our strategy, in particular with a focus on Europe and the Middle East and Africa, because that's what the CLAL team asked me to do, and I'm very good at following uh, rules. Um, so um, Fonterra's strategy and, and who we are, um, I guess the starting point is that we are a farmer-owned cooperative. That's very important. So we are owned by a little over 10,500 New Zealand farmers in New Zealand. The only way that you can own a share in Fonterra is to supply us with milk. And indeed, the only way you can supply us with milk in New Zealand is if you are a shareholder. And the shareholding is in proportion to how much milk they supply. In terms of global production, we produce and process about 86% of the milk produced in New Zealand. That's about sort of 17 to 18 billion litres of milk in New Zealand. And then we produce and process the equivalent of about 5 billion litres of milk outside New Zealand. And I'll go into some details of, of what that looks like uh, in, the, in, in future slides. So our ambition is to be a globally relevant cooperative, which means that we aim to make the li difference in the lives of 2 billion people by 2025. And the business platforms that we focus on um, start with, um, oh, I won't go forwards, I'll go stay there. Start with milk supply. As a dairy company, if you don't have access to milk, you've got a big problem. So that's the core of what we, what we do. Um, the um, majority of our products are sold in bulk ingredients forms uh, to customers who then uh, will reprocess it into either uh, consumer format powders or into white cheeses, as the presentation uh, before um, showed, or into bakery products and the like. So that is the majority of what we do. Um, but we have growth ambitions in our consumer branded products uh, and food service products, which I will go into a little bit of detail further. So, in terms of the strategy, there are what we call six strategic platforms that start with optimizing our New Zealand milk pool, but have ambitions around growing our consumer and our food service uh, uh, businesses in particular, and focusing on a limited number of markets for our consumer brands. So I can, I can put you at ease now and say that we have no ambitions at all to develop a consumer branded position in Europe. That's not what we're about. What we do in Europe, and I'll come to this later, is purely ingredients. The markets that we're looking at for consumer products really focusing on are what we call our leadership markets, which are New Zealand, uh, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, and Chile. Uh, and those, positions where we, those markets where we have a strategic uh, leadership position in certain categories, but not across the whole market, which are China, Indonesia, Australia, and Brazil. So that's the focus for our consumer business. Our ingredients business focuses everywhere, wherever there is a demand for our ingredients. Um, and the brands that we focus on are NZMP for our ingredients, um, Anchor for everyday nutrition, Anlean for bone health, and Anmum for maternal and infant nutrition. These brands, Anchor, Anlean, and Anmum, as I say, will not be present in, in Europe, and that is not our ambition. Um, so in terms of where we are today, 
um, a breakdown of the volumes that are going through the different channels. At the moment, we're selling about 26% of our product through the global dairy trade auction platform that was discussed yesterday. Um, we sell about 55% of our uh, product goes through ingredients that are not sold on global dairy trade, and then about 19% is going through consumer and food service positions. So in the future, we'll continue to be mostly an ingredients company, but the ambition is to grow this piece. So by 2025, we want to have 30% in consumer and food service and reduce slightly the, the numbers on ingredients and, and global dairy trade. But of course, the volume by 2025 will be, will be greater as well. So even though the percentages will be lower, there'll still be growth in our ingredients platforms as well. So that's our high-level global strategy. The second part of my presentation, I'd like to put New Zealand as a milk-producing country in context. And as I say, uh, we only process or we process about 86% of the milk in New Zealand. So a lot of the numbers will be for the industry as a whole rather than just Fonterra in this section of my presentation. Um, so in terms of, uh, I guess, back to Fonterra, the, the trends we're seeing, this has been discussed already, so I'll go over it quickly. But um, we're seeing the rise of emerging markets. That's where the growth is coming from. No surprise there. Globally, there are some other trends that are very important to us. Specialist nutrition for the elderly with aging populations, particularly in the West, very important. But then a focus on nutrition for the young, with people having smaller families, the money that people are willing to put into their children for specialist infant nutrition actually increases. And so these are, are growing and profitable markets to focus on within, within the total market. It's already been discussed the importance of food safety and quality. That's a non-negotiable. If you're making food, if it makes people sick, uh, that's a disaster. So you need to have a quality standard that is absolutely uh, non-negotiable. Uh, commodity price volatility is a challenge for everybody in the market, and then increasingly people are buying um, the products that they do purchase through different mechanisms, through mobile phones, through, through other um, online platforms rather than traditional markets. So the, the route to market is changing the way we think about consumers globally as well. This is just a, uh, a global dairy trade weighted average um, prices. You see the, it's a little bit out of date. That was the rise rally we had at the start of the year. Sadly, it's gone down again. But this just shows the, the challenge that we uh, work on, under. Uh, because as a dairy cooperative, all of the, the, the returns that we make go to our farmers. And um, even though the long-term picture for dairy is very positive, with growing numbers of wealthy consumers in emerging markets who have a real demand for dairy, navigating the short-term challenges that we have with low prices at present and volatility in general is, is the challenge. So how do we get to that positive long-term future while going through this, this short-term challenge? This is a slide from the OECD, and I guess it's just to make the point that um, New Zealand producers receive no direct payments from the government. So there is no common agricultural policy equivalent for New Zealand. And that means that the prices that we as Fonterra pay for milk are the only source of income that those farmers have. They don't get any money from the government. So that means that um, we have to pay the highest price that we can pay. And if the price is low, there is no recourse to intervention. There is no recourse to direct payments. That's where New Zealand sits. The European Union is in the middle, and obviously the countries like Japan, Switzerland, and Norway are at the top end in terms of subsidies. So we are affected. Uh, more heavily, uh, it would be fair to say, our farmer base by the volatility on global markets than is the case for farmers who have a percentage of their income coming from subsidies. So where does New Zealand sit? Because there's so much focus on New Zealand in global markets. And it's important to stress just how small we are in terms of global milk production. So in 2014, the European Union produced um, approximately just under 150 billion litres of milk. In New Zealand, it was a little over 20 billion litres. So in global terms, New Zealand produces between 2 and 3% of world production. Now on this graph, the top line is monthly production in the European Union. That squiggly line at the bottom is New Zealand. So you see how seasonal we are because we have a, a pasture-based farming system. So in our winter months in, in July, June, July, there's almost no production in New Zealand. And at our peak production day in October, uh, we're producing uh, in New Zealand 80 times 
the amount of milk that we produce at the bottom of the season. So Fonterra as a producer needs to be able to handle the amount of milk that comes on the peak day. And then we have factories sitting doing absolutely nothing in the winter months because that's the most efficient farming system. And as a cooperative, we're designed about making sure that you keep your costs on farm low. But even at that day where we're producing the maximum amount, you see that we're still a very, very long way away from the European Union. And indeed, Germany and France both produce more milk than New Zealand does. So this is just to put the scale of New Zealand in proportion. We're really not that big. We are larger than Italy. I think you have, what, sort of 10 or 11 billion litres of milk to our 20, but compared to the European Union, not so much. However, if you look at a product tonne basis on export markets, the EU and New Zealand are by far the two largest. This is a graph that shows it on product tonnes. Because Europe exports more cheese that contains more water, obviously um, it, uh, its number looks bigger. If you were to convert that back into milk, New Zealand and the EU are, are both sort of you know, much closer in terms of production. So we're a very large player in that very small market of product that crosses borders. And that's, that's a factor of the fact that in New Zealand we only have four and a half million people. So we cannot produce just to feed our own people. We need to export. We have no choice about that. Now, where do we export to? These are numbers from 2014, and by far the largest market is now China, uh, with the United States, Australia, Japan, the United Arab Emirates being, being behind. Now, what's extraordinary about this is how quickly this has changed. I've only been working for Fonterra since 2008. When I joined Fonterra, the largest market was the United States. So this growth has happened very, very quickly. Um, and this, these are some numbers that show that uh, 2006, versus 2014 numbers, you see Asia as a whole has um, ex, you know, experienced a, a doubling of New Zealand exports. Middle East, North Africa has had good growth, but you've seen declines in the volumes that New Zealand sends to Europe, Latin America, and North America. And I should say that um, the history of the New Zealand dairy industry actually started uh, up until the early 1970s with really one export market, and that was the United Kingdom, Britain. And this all changed when they joined the common market. So our history has been around firstly being the export market to, to meet British demand. Then they joined the European common market, and we had to look elsewhere. We developed markets like Japan, the United States, and then in the last few years, China. So that, that is our world. We live and die by global commodity markets. So this last bit of the presentation comes on to what the CLAL team asked me to focus on, which is what are we thinking about Europe and the Middle East and North Africa? The first point to make about, about that demand point and the emerging markets, and also um, the Middle East and North Africa, is that um, you see these uh, areas where there's green are net importers of dairy products. This is, these are numbers from 2013, so obviously Russia is still very significant in these numbers. That's come back. But you see that you have the major exporters in the world, the United States, um, the Southern Cone in Latin America, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, and Belarus, exporting to these areas where you see more green. So that band around North Africa, Southeast Asia, um, we'll hear from uh, our friend from Amul, Mr. Sodi, later that India, with its restrictive trade policies, is the real exception in this area in terms of imports. So our strategy is not very surprising or very original. It's that we're focused on taking our surplus to those areas where there's demand for imports, the deficit areas. So, and, and the Middle East and North Africa is absolutely part of that because there's a growing demand with growing populations and growing wealth in these countries, and they want dairy products and don't have the ability to meet their own demands internally, uh, demand internally. So as well as New Zealand, um, we're also looking to develop export positions in other parts of the world. And the reason we're doing this, there's a couple of reasons. The first reason is that New Zealand um, has a, a range of constraints that mean that we will not be able to grow our milk production in New Zealand very fast in the future. We have environmental constraints. We have the constraints of the New Zealand farming system, the pastoral system, which means you need to have a lot of land for that. And a lot of the good land for dairy farming in New Zealand has already been turned into dairy farms because it's the best returning use of that land. So our potential for growth in the next 10 or 20 years is less than the growth that we've seen over the last 10 or 20 years. So if we have ambitions to be a globally relevant cooperative, we need to develop uh, export positions in those parts of the world where milk is growing, and that means Europe, the North, Ameri North America, and, and South America. 
Um, the second reason, and I'll come back to this later, is that we have a real constraint in terms of whey products in New Zealand. And so we come to the big producing countries for, for cheese in Europe for that. So already we are processing and exporting the equivalent of about 600 to 800 million litres of milk out of Europe and significant numbers out of, of Chile in particular uh, as well. And the investments that we're making around the world are really based on this concept of meeting um, demand in these large emerging markets, particularly China, uh, with investments in Europe, Australia, and optimising our assets in, in New Zealand. So this is the second part of the story. We've got sort of growth constraints in New Zealand in the future that we're forecasting, but also we have a lack of access to whey, and whey is particularly important for um, those platforms that we were talking about uh, with maternal health, with sports nutrition, which is something we haven't discussed, and so on. So these are some New Zealand export numbers, and you see the extraordinary growth we've had in our whole milk powder exports, and the investments that we're putting into New Zealand are increasingly focused on milk powders and whole milk powder. You see that exports of skim milk powder over the last five or six years have been relatively flat, and the green number down the bottom, cheese, is also not an area that we're focusing our growth on. So if you want access to whey, and you have no additional cheese production, you have a problem, and that's a problem we're solving by investments in Europe and partnerships. So we've started with um, a partnership in the United Kingdom with First Milk. We've got a partnership in Lithuania with a company called Rikiskio, and a partnership that's uh, not yet operational, will be operational by the end of the year, uh, with Dairycrest uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, these are all partnerships where we work closely with them and they, they own and operate the assets. Um, but the, the big change for us is that we've made a major investment in our processing facility in the Netherlands at a place called Heronvein, focused on making um, whey protein isolates, whey protein concentrate 80, uh, and lactose, so all of the, the products that come from the whey stream. And this is what the factory looks like. It uh, began first production in December 2014. Uh, and uh, to give you a sense of the scale, um, it was producing uh, 4,000 tonnes of product by last month, April 2015. So the, the, um, the aim is to produce about 5,000 tonnes a year of whey protein products and 25,000 tonnes a year of lactose products, um, aimed at paediatric, maternal and sports nutrition um, sectors, as I mentioned. I should say this is built um, in collaboration with a Dutch cheese company called Aware. They make the cheese and we take their whey and process it, so we're not making cheese in Europe. Um, I'll skip over this, but it's just to highlight that um, the Middle East, uh, Africa, and um, the former Soviet countries are important for us. We have um, offices, the sales offices are in red, and we actually have a production facility in, in Saudi Arabia as well. So the investments we've made in terms of um, supporting the growth in the Middle East and Africa is around our Saudi New Zealand milk products plant, which produces a white style cheese, not dissimilar to the one mentioned in the last presentation, uh, but is also producing, um, they pack milk powder there and, uh, and cut uh, natural cheddar style cheeses. So these are all from dairy ingredients imported from New Zealand. And we have a joint venture in South Africa with the largest South African dairy company, Clover. So that joint venture is called Fonterra Clover Ingredients. So you see we're, we're investing to support the growth that we're seeing coming in these large emerging markets, but also partnering with the local leaders and many multinational companies by supplying them ingredients into the Middle East and Africa as well. So I'm sorry if that was very quick, and I apologise to our interpreters who are working very hard to understand my New Zealand accent. That cannot be easy, so well done, thank you. Um, some concluding thoughts for, for you. Um, I've mentioned the ambition that we have uh, to make a, a difference in the lives of two billion consumers by 2025. Uh, it's important to remember that the majority of our business will remain ingredients focused, though we are looking to move into higher margin products in selected markets and not in Europe. Um, secondly, we know that the long term dynamics for dairy are positive. There are growing consumers and this is a dairy is a nutritious, tasty, good product. It's a good sector to be in. It just doesn't feel like that at the moment with prices low and the price volatility that we're seeing. So we need strategies that work in the downtimes and the uptimes. And I think it's important to remember that volatility will never go away. It is a function of markets. And as, as we in New Zealand have been exposed to markets forever because we have no choice but to export, we know this is a reality. We'd rather have volatility where you sometimes get high prices than stable prices where the price is always low. 
So volatility in itself isn't evil as long as you get exposure to the high prices rather than having stable low prices, which is what many of our customers would like. They say, we'd like price stability too. What's our discount? So um, it's about managing that volatility. Um, I'd say, and this is um, a quote from the OECD, that payments from governments to mitigate income risks should not crowd out market-based risk management tools and farmers' own management of normal business risks. This is just a point, it's a bit wordy, I guess, but it's a point that um, we need market-based tools, we need to realise that dairy farming is a business and needs to be treated as such, and um, the reality is that the common agricultural policy will not have additional funding in the future. So we know that the answer in Europe cannot be um, higher uh, direct payments or coupled payments. So we, we need to navigate the market together, and that's a challenge for European and New Zealand producers. And then finally, linked to that, we've seen the huge impact that the Russia ban had on world markets. We had European cheese moving into skim milk powder and, and butter and being exported to markets where New Zealand has a stronger position, so it indirectly impacted New Zealand. And my, my comment on that would be um, open markets with limited barriers to trade, trade it actually increases the resilience of the entire market to market shocks. So what that means is that if you have one major market that you're focused on, if there's a problem there, you can move your, your trade to the next best returning market, but you can only do that if there's an openness to trade. And it's very encouraging to hear that, that uh, Agriculture Commissioner Hogan has referred to Europe's trade policy as being the third pillar of the common agricultural policy. What that means, I hope, is that Europe is more aggressive in looking for market access, which is, of course, something that we support as, as Fonterra because we like the ability to trade, but increasingly we're looking to export more from Europe. So anything that helps us to export from Europe is a good thing. So I know that's a lot of material. I'm sure there will be many questions. As I say, it's a pleasure to be here, but thank you for uh, listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Reid.